Hello and welcome. Today we will talk about chapter 13, Comparative Global Industrial Relations. This is the last chapter in Labor Relations and Collective Bargaining uh, class, so I hope you enjoy this last topic and reflect upon how these laws and rules of just and fair management practices for employees apply beyond our own organizations, beyond our own borders, on a universal basis. The goal of managers and workers should be, in all cases, to work together to produce a product or a service that's beneficial to others in society. And this requires, obviously, the engagement and involvement of everyone equally and fairly. So I hope you can do that. The chapter focuses on globalization, worldwide labor movement, international labor organization, also talks about Anglophone countries and some of the laws in history of labor relation laws that have been enacted in those countries. It talks about European Union nations, also the Far East. So you have a lot of examples of different countries that can be adopted locally into your specific organization and also within the culture. First of all, let's start talking about what do we mean by globalization. So in this chapter, similar to other textbooks and other experts, they mention that globalization refers to the expansion of international goods and services, obviously beyond our own borders on a worldwide basis. So globalization is the degree of interdependence that goes along with the integration of production across national boundaries in the resulting increase in international investment by multinational enterprises. There's deregulation in liberalization that we've seen over the past 50 to 100 years. Historically, we're seeing the deregulation in liberalization of trade among countries. This is usually considered to be the result of global, regional, bilateral trade and investment negotiations in countries consequently have lowered their barriers to trade and investment by liberalizing trade quotas, tariffs, and deregulated national capital controls. And trade unions have formed at the national level and today are challenged by globalizations. The challenge facing trade unions in the era of globalization is to ensure that structural change and adaptation are achieved without compromising the goals of full employment and social justice for all employees, especially when those employees are members of the trade unions. We can see this from industrial revolution point of view. So through intervention in innovation, enterprises have substituted machinery for human labor. We see that using new chemical and metallurgical processes have actually harnessed new forms of energy to fuel production. We see that the Industrial Revolution have resulted in the emergence of factories with large concentrations of workers, in some cases hundreds and thousands, both in developed economies as well as developing in third world countries. The Industrial Revolution has also resulted in an interdependent production process which has required a hierarchy style of management in a clear division of labor between different types of workers. Let us look at Profile 13-1, International Framework Agreements or IFA. The question that the authors pose for you is what do Volkswagen, Daimler, Chrysler, Renault, and BMW, all of them are global automotive industry giants, what do they have in common with IKEA, which is a Swedish furniture company? These international companies have joined dozens of others in entering into international framework agreements, as explained in this article from the International Metal Workers Federation. International framework agreements are negotiated between a transnational company and the trade unions of its workforce at the global level. 
It is a global instrument with the purpose of ensuring fundamental workers' rights in all the target companies' locations. Thus, IFAs are negotiated on a global level but implemented locally. Generally, an IFA recognizes the ILO core labor standards. In addition, the company should also agree to offer decent wages and working conditions as well as to provide a safe and hygienic work environment for all workers, clients, suppliers, and vendors. Furthermore, there is an agreement that suppliers must be persuaded to comply. And finally, the IFA includes trade unions in the implementation. Through international framework agreements, the National Labor Organization's core labor standards can be guaranteed in all facilities of a transnational company, which is especially helpful in transitional in developing countries where legislation is sometimes insufficient, poorly enforced, or anti-worker. For transnational companies, IFAs can secure good relations with trade unions and contribute to a positive public image. Of course, more and more companies increasingly see the need to respond to the growing ethical concerns of consumers and investors. For trade unions, IFAs are a way to promote workers' rights in the global arena. The arrangement guarantees influence in the possibility of a dialogue that is mutually beneficial. Unlike unilateral codes of conduct, IFAs emphasize implementation, which paves the way for actual improvements. In terms of democratic revolution, we see that monarchs have been replaced by representative governments. And in capitalistic revolution, we see the market economy has replaced the mercantile system. Also, the capitalist revolution has brought private property ownership uh, labor markets in trade unions. As you recall from your economics classes, the mercantile system is basically a system of managing the economy of a country through the regulation of foreign trade. And the goal of the mercantile system has always been to establish a permanent positive balance of trade by implementing certain relevant trade policies and practices such as having high tariffs on inbound goods. With regards to the growth of trade unions, we see several major roles like market function, class function, and social function. Market function represents in advance the employment interest of its members through collective bargaining as workplace representatives. Class function is about fighting the battles for the rights and interest of all workers to increase workers' status in power in the economic and political systems. In social function means improving the overall quality of life of all workers, promoting greater social justice, better schools, and better healthcare system for all workers and citizens in the community. So government responses to the growth of trade unions have been of several nature. First has been suppression, second is tolerance, and third is encouragement of trade unions. In terms of economic and social movements influencing global industries, think about the Manchester School of Thought, capitalism, mercantilism, and neoliberalism that is discussed in your textbook. The Manchester School is the economic theory that agreed with the non-interference maxim of capitalism, however, without the emphasis on human capital. In capitalism is the economic theory that a nation's prosperity relies on a more productive use of human capital, and that by increasing the division of labor, there would be greater productivity the development of new machinery and of new skills in trades among workers. A capitalistic or market economy is characterized by the principles of free trade, competition, and choice, and of non-interference by government. The mercantilism economic theory states that a nation's prosperity depends on the amount of its capital and by the volume at which its ex exports exceed its imports. So this kind of system of economics requires a protectionist role of the government in encouraging more exports 
but discouraging imports coming in. Neoliberalism refers to a political and economic philosophy that de-emphasizes or rejects government intervention in the economy, focusing instead on achieving progress in even social justice by encouraging free market methods in fewer restriction on business operations in economic developments. We also see the introduction of International Labor Organization, otherwise known as ILO. The International Labor Organization was created as a parallel organization to the League of Nations with a mission to keep the peace within societies that are threatened by class divisions between capital and labor. So there are nine different principles which are written into the International Labor Organization Constitution. It includes labor should not be treated as a commodity. Workers have the right to organize. Workers should get a reasonable wage to maintain a reasonable standard of living in the cities and locations where they are operating. Work should be limited to basically an eight hour work day or 48 hour work per week. So there should be at least one day of rest each week for every worker. Obviously no child labor they should be equal pay for equal work between men and women and between people of different ethnicities, different cultures, different age groups. And there should be equitable treatment of all immigrants or laborers who come from other countries in enforcement of the labor laws on a consistent and fair basis. In international labor organizations, we also see that tripartite organizational structure which basically means the unique international labor organization governance structure in which government, employers, and workers are equal parties. So the main work of the international labor organization was to enact international conventions and recommendations regarding labor. There are many countries that have been discussed in your textbook, so for examples of what has been done in various countries, you can see more details by the authors. For example, Australia has a unique labor history. Where in 1904, they had a federal compulsory conciliation arbitration of labor disputes. So their Workplace Relations Act, otherwise known as WRA, had a streamlined award system, more emphasis on enterprise bargaining, curbing the union power, restrictions on strikes, in a streamlined unfair dismissal system that limited frivolous appeals in compensation claims. We also see that the European Union EU is a regional body made up of about 27 member states on the continent of Europe that delegate their sovereignty on questions of joint interest to common institutions which represent the interest of the EU as a whole. That EU member states are not one single new nation. So each nation still runs independent of the others. The Treaty of Maastricht in 1992 enhanced the European Union through intergovernmental cooperation in adding new forms of cooperation between member states in the European community particularly on issues of defense and in the area of justice and home affairs. Germany, for example, has trade unions negotiate wage agreements. They have work councils which negotiate work conditions. And they also focus on the co-determination which gives employees a seat on boards. In the corporate governance area, co-determination also is known as co-partnership or worker participation. So it's a practice of workers having the right to vote for representatives on the board of directors in the company. So co-determination also refers to the staff having binding rights in work councils on issues in their workplace. France has a strong legacy of class conflict. France, after World War II, emerged as a major economic power. In the French collective bargaining legislation names the employers and employees bodies that have representative status. The negotiations can be carried out at all levels of economic activity. 
Italy has industrial relations which are governed by constitution, act of parliament, regional laws, customs and practice, and also the European Union. Let us look at some of the challenges associated with bringing about positive progress in Italy. The example of Marco Biaggi. So in profile three, we started discussion by talking about United States, where the violence that accompanied the fledging labor movement in the 19th century produced regrettable but infrequent incidents of deaths among labor leaders. These types of incidents, however, are far removed from today's labor movement. But it would seem the same is not true in Italy. On March 19, 2002, terrorists claiming to be from the Red Brigades murdered Marco Biaggi, an Italian labor law and industrial relations expert who was actually working with the Italian Labor Ministry on labor law reforms. Three years prior to this, terrorists who identified themselves as Red Brigades claimed to have murdered Massimo D'Antona who was also advising the government on labor relations. Biaggi was consulting on a proposal to reform the Italian labor market by changing the protections that were offered to laid off or fired workers under a system that makes a third of Italy's 21 million workers virtually invulnerable to firing. On the day of his death, Biaggi had published an article in the Italian leading business newspaper and he argued that Italy needed to change its welfare system to catch up with Europe's biggest economies. Biaggi was a professor of labor law at the University of Modena and a consultant to the European Union. He was a member of the Italian Socialist Party, but had worked with the center-right government of Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi because he knew that Italy needed to change its labor market. As Biaggi biked home from work, he was gunned down by two men on motorcycle outside his home, just steps away from his wife and child and just months after his security escort had been discontinued after threats over his work on a Milan employment pact. So violence, unfortunately, has been part of labor movement. It doesn't mean we have to resort to violence, but it does mean that as labor leaders, we have to be very careful in trying to balance the needs of both workers in society in general to make progressive movements toward what is right, what is fair, and what is ethical in all cases. In Japan, we see that industrialization began in the late 1880s. There were three historic premises of Japanese labor. First is the lifetime employment where most employees are retained for life in that organization or that company. Second is seniority where pay raises are based on service and tenure and third is the enterprise or the employer based unions. They practice the concept of kiritsu. Kiritsu is basically a group of holding companies within the Japanese environment. So kiritsu is basically a system series or grouping of enterprises, uh, which is a set of companies with interlocking business relationships in shareholdings in each other's organizations. So if they have a similar or shared interest, that means they coordinate and cooperate to help each other succeed. In the legal sense, Kiritsu is a type of informal business group that are loosely organized alliances within the social world of the Japan uh, business community. The Kiritsu has maintained dominance over the Japanese economy for the second half of the 20th century and to a lesser extent continues to do so in the early 21st century environment as well. In the Far East, we also see China, where Mao established a centralized planned government after World War II. The planned economy of set wages, set prices, and employment, uh, socialist market economy changed to state-owned market enterprises. And China has obviously done very, very well through their mixed current economy 
where change seems to happen a lot faster because there's one government that obviously decides something on behalf of everybody in the country and once it's decided by relevant parties within the government, they implement it fairly quickly. If you look at China's foreign trade over the years, for example, in 1996, their imports were about $151 billion and their exports were about $138 billion. However, over a 10-year period, we can see that their imports in 2008 were $1,233 billion. However, their exports were $1,428 billion. So in terms of balance of trade, they have maintained a good amount of imports coming in, but their exports have increased. Their products and services seem to be much cheaper than many developed economies. So therefore, the developed economies tend to buy their products from China and as a result, China is able to keep more people employed in producing those products at a cheaper wage rate and thereby those workers earning some income, paying taxes, and the economy gets stronger and stronger. We want speedy progress. However, it doesn't always happen as easily as we would like it to happen. Keep in mind that not all of these labor laws apply to every organization or every country. So in Afghanistan, obviously there are a lot of laws that the Afghan constitution affords all workers. Your job as a manager and as a professional is to make sure you abide by those laws that are governed by the Afghan constitution. And your responsibility is to go above and beyond that. So in cases where the law conflicts with moral or ethical behaviors, your job is to go above and beyond the law to make sure you are both legal and also ethical and moral in terms of applying the laws to your workers, to your colleagues, and to people that your employees deal with in the local communities throughout Afghanistan. I want to focus on two different quotations that I have with me here in the office. One focuses on success. You can see here behind me, this quotation basically states that success is getting what you want. However, happiness is wanting what you get. As managers, as an employees, you will have your desires, your wishes. Hopefully, what you get makes you happy. I also would like to remind you about a second quotation and the attitude of thinking win-win in all cases when you're going into negotiations or bargaining agreement situations. This quotation about attitude this quotation about attitude states that what happens to a man is less significant than what happens within him. Having the right attitude is extremely critical for any effective negotiations. So always go with the attitude of thinking win-win for your side as well as for the other side. So in order to be a sustainable long-term success in your field, in your profession. Always think about aiming for the right outcomes. Because as the quotation said, if you're not happy with what you get, you'll always obviously be disappointed with the fact that you didn't aim for the right goals. So hopefully you'll be happy with what you have and want what you have. But it also means continue to have developmental aims and goals and always go with the right attitude in any workplace negotiations or bargaining agreement discussions. Keep in mind that you'll always have the textbook as your reference. So please refer to textbook for any additional content, best practices related to labor relations in collective bargaining, both in private as well as in public sectors. 
especially if you're going to work in the United States or any company that is American based, it's very important to be aware of these laws in regulations. So as a manager, as a professional employee, you can be successful. So keep this textbook with you, use it for writing articles, writing your own thoughts, and obviously to develop research-based mindset. And if needed, you can always contact me at the university through my email address, which is mujtaba at nova.edu, or you can always reach me if you're in the United States or traveling to this side of the world. You can contact me at my office. Uh, my phone number is written there for you. And feel free to uh, send me any articles that are relevant for future application in this classroom or any best practices or if you ever would like to be a guest lecturer in a future class regarding labor relations or collective bargaining. So if you have any personal experiences or would like to write articles from a personal experience perspective, let me know. I'll be happy to guide, help, or co-author with you. And finally, there have been many other resources that I've used as part of developing these lectures for you. So again, it's not just one textbook or one article, but there could be hundreds of articles that help us to develop a better understanding of human relations and collective bargaining procedures, processes, rules, laws, and so on. So continue to develop your library of articles, uh, both academic and practical, that you can use for future research and for teaching purposes in the area of human resources management. Good luck to you. Now, all the chapters have been covered. Hopefully you have been able to keep up with your readings of the various cases, various theories, various concepts in the textbook. And if you listen to the lectures, hopefully they were helpful to point out some of the important material in these chapters. However, obviously a short lecture cannot cover these comprehensive chapters, which provides you not only the theories, but also suggestions from experts in the field of labor relations in collective bargaining agreements. But as a master of business, hopefully you go above and beyond the textbook by looking at journal articles in other cases that are more recent, both internationally as well as locally, to make good and fair decisions for you, for other managers, for your employees, and obviously for society and government in any trade unions that might exist in your city or in your areas. Overall, let's go ahead and provide a quick summary of some of the major concepts in a very short period of time. So we talked about labor relations, and we said that labor relation represents any activity between management and unions or employees concerning the negotiation or implementation of a collective bargaining agreement. We also talked about bargaining agreements or collective bargaining agreements, which is a written and signed document between the employer entity in a labor organization which specifies the terms and conditions of employment for a specified period of time. In labor organization or union is basically any employee committee or other organization of any kind where employees deal with employers concerning their grievances, labor disputes, their wages, the uh, amount of hours that they work, and obviously the conditions of their work in their departments on a day-to-day, week-to-week, or annual basis. A labor union can be any organization of workers that are dedicated to protecting their interest in the workplace and improving their wages, improving their working hours, and overall working conditions for the employees or members who are paying their dues on a regular basis. In terms of capitalism, the collective bargaining, uh, we know that the freedom to enter into contract and to decide the use of one's economic resources such as capital and labor are essential concepts in capitalistic or democratic environments. 
employers are free to seek employees and offer them economic resources in exchange for their work or labor in the organization. And we know that employees are free to enter into contract or not for their labor as they wish. In the state of Florida and many other states in the U.S., we have what we call at-will employment status. So at-will employment basically means that an employee can quit his or her job at any time he or she wishes and that managers can terminate the employment of an employee at any time and for any reason that he or she wishes. Of course, managers and employers have to be very careful not to fire or terminate the work of people based on their gender, based on their religion, based on their race or skin color, or other protected categories that apply according to the laws in the United States. If you're going to be involved in union bargaining agreements or in organizations where employees want to be unionized, keep in mind the do's and don'ts that were discussed in this textbook. The textbook talked about there are things that you as a manager cannot and may not do. So managers are often told to remember tips, remember that terminology we talked about before. You know, as managers, do not threaten, do not interrogate, do not promise, and do not spy on your employees. Those activities and those actions should be avoided in order to be fair and not in violation of any laws. However, as managers, you can do certain things to obviously campaign against the unions. So things a manager can do to discourage unionization is the acronym FOR, F-O-R-E. Focus on the facts, focus on your offering your opinion, focus on the rules, and obviously you can share your experience with the employees. Keep in mind that the law is not the best guide about what is ethical in employee-employer relationships. Sometimes in action might be legal but not right. Ethics means making decisions that represent what you stand for, not just what the laws are. So always aim toward being an ethical manager, an ethical mediator, an ethical arbitrator, and obviously an ethical individual in any negotiations between you, the managers, the employee, or the union. As you're negotiating, we mentioned that negotiation tends to be a process where two or more individuals are seeking a mutually beneficial goal for the parties that they're representing. However, each party obviously has their own side so eventually through effective negotiation you come up with something that is both fair for this side as well as for this side. What we consider to be a win-win negotiation. Keep in mind the model that I presented for you, the ink in model of negotiation, where you initiate the negotiation, you negotiate, and then you close the deal. But keep in mind the fourth step, which is very important, and that is to maintain the relationship so that maintenance of a relationship might require you to renegotiate or open up the negotiation process in order to have a win-win in sustainable relationship with the other side or the other party. During negotiations or before negotiations, keep in mind your target point, which is the negotiator's most preferred point or ideal settlement area. Remember you but not the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Before you go into the negotiation, brainstorm on what is your but now, what is it that you can live with, and obviously come up with various alternatives or give and take so you can be prepared before you go into a bargaining agreement where you have to be involved in negotiations or give and takes. Remember, there are some benefits that employees will want. Wages are means of attracting, retaining, and motivating workers. However, benefits provide income for them regardless of unforeseen circumstances. And all bargaining negotiations emphasize what is fair to all parties, cultivate trust between you and the other parties, and manage any types of conflicts with good intention in aiming for win-win for all sides. Ultimately, it's your responsibility to be fair to yourself, to your employees, 
into your company, in society in general. Good luck in being a professional employee, a good manager, a good mediator, a good arbitrator, or a good neutral third party. Mr. Mohtaram, I fasli akhribud ke sarish besyar kam gabzadim. Bazam, de tamam faslai ke ma lecturei besyar ko taberitan مقرر ساختم خدا کنه که یک چیز از او عملی بتانه وقت زیاد نبود وقت کم بود من تا کوشش کردم که کوتا کوتا ای فصلا را براتان تشریح کنم یا چیزایی که مهم بود براتان بگویم خدا کنه که خود شما بتانین ای قانونای امریکایی ای قانونای بیر ملالی را در افغانستان عملی بسازین ارزوی می است که از نگاه پروگرام مستری که شما خلاص میکنین باید از قانونای بین المللی را یاد بگیرین و کورسای شما به انگلیسی است شاید که بتانین که مقاله های بسیار خوب و به استعداد بین المللی نوشته کنین که مقاله هایتان در جرنال های مختلف چاپ شود دومی ارزوی می است که ای قانون هایی که امریکایی بوده یا قانون های بین المللی است شما او را بتانین که به خیر در افغانستان عملی بسازین کل قانون ها شاید عملی نشوه منتا او قانون هایی که مناسب است برای کلچر ما شما برای مردم ما شما برای وطن ما شما او قانون هایی که دباره کلچر و انانات خود وطن ما شما خوب است خدا کنه که او را بتانین عملی بسازه باز هم هرچی شد کم ما و کرم شما خدا میربان است که بخیر یک روزی به که مشکلات های کرونا وایرس و بقیه امراض ختم شوه و باز هم انشالله رو برو یک جای بشینیم ببینیم گپ بزنیم و خدا میربان است که فراغت کل شما را از پروگرام ماستری ببینم موفق باشین Good luck.